On this screencast, I want to just kind of briefly go through the different kinds of chemical bonds that we talked about in class, just as a review. Um, it's, it's important to note, first off, um, why bond? Why do chemicals bond to begin with? Why not stay singular? Well, the whole idea behind chemical bonding is to find stability. Chemicals bond in order to become more stable. In terms of what? Well, in terms of potential energy. All right. Um, many chemicals or many elements on their own have a high potential energy. And elements at, at, in a state of high potential energy are unstable. In order to reach stability, they want to bond with something else. And when they bond with something else, their potential energy drops. They become more comfortable, more stable. And uh, that's the state in which they'll be in, in rest, essentially. Think about um, potential energy in terms of if you are at the top of um, a cliff, you're at high potential energy. All right? It's not comfortable at the top of a cliff. At the bottom of a cliff, you're at low potential energy. You're on the ground. You're stable. That's what elements are like when they're in a bonded situation. So why bond? To find stability. Types of bonds. Here we go. Ionic bonds, covalent bonds. Once we get into covalent bonds, we break them up into polar versus nonpolar. We've also got metallic bonds and we've got hydrogen bonds. So let's break these down one at a time. We'll go through. Um, first, we'll get to the ionic bonding. And here they are. It's important to note, first of all, that ionic bonds are between metals and nonmetals. So thinking about the periodic table, we know the metals are on the left, the nonmetals are on the right. And what's happening to find stability? Well, the electrons are being transferred from one atom to another. That's important to know that they're transferred from one atom to another. They're changing hands in this situation. Um, it's an idea of oxidation versus reduction. The atom that's gaining electrons in an ionic bond, if you think about it, the electron has a negative charge. So if the, if the atom is gaining that electron, its charge is going to be reduced. Conversely, the other atom, which is losing the electron, is oxidated. So we've got oxidation and reduction. And generally speaking, overall, um, and when oxidation and, re and reduction are happening, we call this type of reaction a redox reaction. Let me write that out here for you. Re reaction, there's my shortened version of reaction. All right, redox, you have reduction, you have oxidation going on at the same time. You have electrons being gained here and lost. They're changing hands. The, we said that the atom that gains the electrons, its charge is reduced. Oftentimes it becomes negative. If it's negative, it's an anion. The atom that loses the electron now has more protons than electrons. Therefore, it has a positive charge, or it's a cation. Anions are attracted to cations. Positively charged whatever, anything, positively charged, the positively charged end of a magnet is attracted to the negatively charged end of a magnet. Same thing with elements. This is the electrostatic force. Let's look at this. Let's use, uh, use Lewis dot structures. And let's say we have sodium here. Lewis dot structures show you the number of valence electrons. We know sodium is an alkali metal. It has one valence electron. And let's say, well, we know that sodium will often bond with chlorine. Chlorine is a halogen. So it has seven valence electrons. This valence electron has, this valence shell has one, chlorine has seven. Neither are stable, neither are full, but they can become stable. How can this happen? Well, this comes over here and buddies up with this one. Now they're paired up, and now this valence shell is gone. So this is stable because the next shell then becomes the valence shell. And what happens? Sodium has lost an electron. It's been oxidized, so it becomes a cation. It gets a plus one charge. Chlorine has gained a negatively charged electron. It's now an anion. 
Opposite charge is attracted, that's the electrostatic force, and we make sodium chloride. All right. That's how you would uh, signify an ionic bond if I asked you to draw one out. Covalent bonding is between nonmetals. So recall ionic between the metals and nonmetals. Covalent bonds are between nonmetal atoms. Now what's happening here is electrons are being shared. I put kind of because they're kind of shared and they're kind of fought over. It's kind of like a tug of war between um, atoms over electrons. And let's look at uh, let's look at an example when we talk about polar versus nonpolar. Let's say, well, we know uh, that oxygen will often bond to hydrogen. So let's let's show how this would work. Oxygen has six valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six. Is it happy? No, it's not happy. This electron's lonely, this one's unpaired, so it's lonely. Well, hydrogen can help this situation. Hydrogen has one valence electron. It can pair up here. These are both nonmetals. So how do we signify this pairing? Well, here's this dotted circle. Now, hydrogen has two electrons in its valence shell. Recall that its innermost shell is its outermost shell, so it can only hold two. This one's happy. It's got a buddy. This one is still lonely. We know what we can do. We're going to need another hydrogen. Now we draw that. There it is. Now these are paired up. Oxygen has two, four, six, eight and it's stable. We said that these uh, electrons are shared kind of. Well, recall the idea of, of electronegativity. Let me write that over here. Electronegativity is the affinity of an atom for shared electrons. The affinity of an atom for shared electrons. This oxygen has an affinity for these electrons that it's sharing. This one too. Same with the hydrogen. It has an affinity for the electrons that it's sharing. But if you've watched the periodic trend screencast, you might recall that electronegativity as you're going from lower left to upper right on the periodic table increases. So oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So it's hogging these electrons. They're spending more time toward the oxygen. That is a polar covalent bond. These aren't being shared equally. They're being hogged by one of the par participants in the bond. So that's why we said they're shared kind of. Okay, It's more like they're fought over. It's like a tug of war. Um, so that would be a polar covalent bond. Nonpolar would simply be a situation like this. Uh, we formed H2O here. What if we form H2? We said hydrogen has one valence electron. There these are being shared. Hydrogen obviously has the same electronegativity as hydrogen. All right, These are shared equally. The tug of war is a draw. This is a nonpolar covalent bond. It's a single nonpolar covalent bond. Bonds Covalent bonds can be double bonds, they can be triple bonds. You could draw them this way as well. There's a single bond. Um, here's a triple bond. Two, four, six electrons being shared here. But the key idea here is that the electrons are not changing hands like they were in an ionic bond. Hydrogen bonds. I'm going to do another screencast that basically deals with hydrogen bonds more in depth. Um, but all you need to know at this point is that hydrogen bonds are very, very, very important in water and they give water many unique properties. I wrote out the definition here. It says a hydrogen bond is the attraction between the partially negative oxygen of one water molecule and the partially positive hydrogen of another water molecule. Look here. It's very important this is as a result of polar covalent bonds. We said that um, the electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen are not uh, they're not shared equally. So this oxygen is hogging them 
and those negative, negatively charged electrons are spending more time around the oxygen, thus giving it a partially negative charge. All right, I'll write that. And it's kind of a weird symbol. Looks kind of like that. The oxygen is a partially negative charge. Since the electrons are being ripped away or, or, or hogged from the hydrogen, the hydrogens get a partially positive charge. And so we said it's the attraction between the partially negative oxygen of one water molecule and the partially positive hydrogen of a water, another water molecule. This that I'm tracing is that hydrogen bond. It's the attraction, it's the electrostatic force here that's caused by these partial charges. Very, very, very important for water, very important for life on Earth, and we'll get into it more in a different screencast. Finally, metallic bonds. Metals readily give up their valence electrons. They're very giving, they're very sharing, and they'll let go of them. And what happens when a whole bunch of metal uh, nuclei get rid of their electrons that are floating around, you end up with these metallic nuclei that are positively charged because of the protons, with all of these electrons floating around kind of as a sea of electrons in the middle. And you get a collective sharing of these. So let's say these were all iron nuclei, and you have all these electrons being shared. Well, you have a sheet of iron, essentially, with all these uh, iron nuclei sharing collectively these groups of electrons. So that's why uh, many metals are malleable, because they're kind of flexible, because they're, they're OK with, with uh, these electrons moving around, because there's plenty out there in the sea to share and, and maintain stability. So this is very unique. It's not a bond per se, all right? It's kind of a, a, a collective sharing. You can't really see the bond, but it's, a, it's an overall effect of this free sharing of electrons. And that's kind of an overview of the bonds we've been talking about.